Uh, I want to talk about what I'm not going to do first. I'm not going to, this isn't going to be a treatise uh, or a manifesto. I understand I'm Xing out the work of both Aaron and uh, some other of the league winners this year. It's just a good joke. Don't take it personally. Plus, nobody invited me to this thing. Uh, <laughs> it's also not going to be a lecture on recent work. The internet's great for that. Um, you can also go to the uh, exhibition. So what I am going to do tonight is three things. One, I'm going to offer some insights and observations on sort of humor and architecture. Two, I'm going to describe what's in the gallery, because um, everyone keeps asking me what it's about or what it means. All will be revealed. Uh, and I want to end with a few requests. Uh, keep this in mind. Um, so first, I want to start with some observations on humor in architecture. Um, I want to say quickly that like, this is all framed in humor. It's not all I do. Um, and in fact, if you want to see some of the other stuff I do, Meredith and I have a show. Um, it's part of the Group Under series in Brooklyn next Wednesday. And you can see some of this, our current project, which is called Post Rock, where we're trying to make uh, artificial plastic conglomerate out of plastic and inorganic material. And then we're 3D scanning them for some reason. Um, <laughs> but you should just come and be a part of the conversation. So. Uh, I want to talk about humor and architecture. This is clear, right? You guys can all read this. Um, <laughs> architecture is the straight man of the world. Um, I think, uh, at least in the way I framed the, uh, the statement for the, you know, the submission, there are three points about our, you know, architecture and humor that I think are really important. This is the first one. Um, and this is the kind of way into humor uh, for me as an architect. And I think uh, in one way, it's just that architecture and architects especially are so serious. Um, and we all know that. And usually the humor in our world comes from us as figures, as like outsized characters, as like funny people, right, or charismatic. And so that is the, is, that's the kind of like way into humor that a lot of people find that I did, and the, and the way that like architecture, humor and architecture can have some power and have some leverage. And so in that way, like David Byrne has been a real uh, inspiration to me. And the way that he can make an incredibly uh, precise and observant criticism of American culture, especially urbanism, and at the same time, um, just care for it, like still love it at the same time. And so that's kind of how I feel about architecture. Um, and this is a project that Russ Meta and I did for um, the storefront show that Keller organized a few years ago. And it, we were acting as kind of like architects at large who were trying to insinuate this lie, this sort of made up fiction about infrastructure into the world. And it kind of worked. Um, and we kind of felt bad about it because it worked. Because um, we had people asking about us like they wanted to work on this project that didn't exist. But so this is number one. And I think it's a really fantastic way that humor and architecture relate, but I think it has some limitations. Uh, number two, humor reveals pieties and disavowed beliefs. So I think what's important about humor is it actually like tells us what our rules are, right? It, humor, something that offends us, something that gets under our skin can actually tell us what we're not allowed to do, right? What we're what we're afraid of means that there are rules in place that we're not actually aware of. And so I think one way that architecture has done this, I mean, one could argue way back before um, the, you know, the 60s or 70s back to Michelangelo, but at least in contemporary architectural production, irony, especially like visual irony, is one way that it's done. Um, and I think that this is great. I love irony. I love visual irony. But it essentially remains in a linguistic mode of humor. And so I think that there's, there's, more, there's more that can be done uh, with architecture and humor that gets beyond the linguistic mode. Um, and so let, let's take like Sam Jacob, for example. Uh, you know, I, I think like his work's amazing. I, I really appreciate what he does. And I think as a character, too, he's important to the field. Um, and the piece he's written, I'm not sure if anybody's read it, but he, he wrote about Acme. Um, as a kind of metaphor for our architect, you know, ar architecture as a discipline, that we're like always looking for some contraption, right, to like 
do something in the world that's better than what we could do um, on our own, and that uh, you know the roadrunner doesn't need anything. With the, we're the coyote, right? Always trying to sort of leverage something to do something in the world we're not capable of. Um, and I think that's really funny, but again, I think it's a metaphor for practice, and it's not actually like architecture being funny. Um, so uh, this is a Jerry Lewis quote, <coughs> comedy is a man in trouble. And so for me, I'm really interested in how architecture can become funny in, you know, in the sort of means of architecture itself. So in spatiality, in, um, you know, in the sort of material matter of the world, I think it can be really funny without us needing the cultural knowledge that allows us to read visual irony. Um, and without, the, without it becoming just a metaphor for how architecture can be in the world. So this is, uh, you guys might know this, but this is a clip from Buster Keaton, where I, this is just incredible. He actually performed this stunt, this isn't a joke, um, where the, yeah, there we go, the house front falls on him, right? And there he is, bewildered, as if he didn't know that was happening. Um, but I think, uh, this offers a mode of, of humor for architecture that is about, um, it's about the material spatial world, right? It's about, it's about architecture as stuff. And so uh, this is me um, at the Piazza d'Italia. So this is me being funny, right? This is me being like funny dude architect in the world. But I think I want to be like really clear that uh, like it's, I think there's something more important about this and the way I want to be an architect is that like what's funny about it isn't me. It's like you know, what's funny is that I'm turning myself into a fountain just like Charles Moore did. Uh, you can read all the layers into it, right? That I'm whatever I'm imitating him, and there's a you know there's some references to uh, Bruce Nauman uh, image in there. But like so for me, I don't want uh, I don't want the relationship to be humor, the relationship between humor and architecture to remain as a sort of stand-up mode, right? I want it to like get out of that in the physical space. Um, so something that was actually really instructive in my thinking on this and inspirational was uh, the the dual sort of the, the dual stars, the the sort of um, of public television, the children's public television in the 60s and 70s. We have Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood over here on your left, and we have Sesame Street on the right. Um, both of these shows were started in the late 60s by people who were terrified um, of the effects of television on children. And so Mr. Rogers <coughs> thought that uh, television was really terrible because it conflated fantasy with reality, and that children would grow up and they wouldn't understand um, because they would be so, their lives would be so mediated by the television that they wouldn't be able to discern between fantasy and reality. So Mr. Rogers' ambition for his show was to be really explicit about what the relationship between fantasy and reality is. So um, if you guys are familiar with the show, there's the trolley here, and this is the land of make-believe, right? Like we all know the set of him in his apartment. He uses the trolley as a device to take us to a place that's a scale model where all the, um, everyone that's in there is like smaller, so you know the difference between like him as a person and the characters as little puppets. Um, so he uses these architectural devices, right, to make sure that kids never confuse the two. Um, Sesame Street, on the <coughs> other hand, saw television as just a new medium and a new reality to be exploited, to, to be educational. So, um, you know, here we have Sesame Street where you know, sort of like neurotic puppets and monsters are able to freely interact with the real world, although it's a kind of Jane Jacobsy real world that's probably somewhere in Brooklyn. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, and, then, and we like we have like people, we have monsters, we have stuff. It's the it's the urban life where fantasy and reality are intentionally blurred. Um, it's not it's not a trivial thing, and it's not an unconscious thing, sort of put these two uh, worlds in, in, con in contrast and in, in interaction. So you think I'm making this up, but actually uh, there were two crossover shows where Big Bird appeared on Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers appeared on Sesame Street. Um, when Big Bird appeared on Mr. Rogers, uh, Fred Rogers insisted that he remain in the world of make-believe. 
so that children wouldn't become confused that he was real, right? So like in Sesame Street, he's real. He walks around on the street. So he was, not only was he confined to the land of make-believe, Fred Rogers was trying to get the puppeteer to tape off the head of Big Bird and reveal to the children that he is, Big Bird is indeed a puppet, a construction. Um, and that, <laughs> and so they compromised that he would remain in the land of make-believe. Uh, when Fred Rogers came on Sesame Street, uh, there they he had a he was a, he was allowed to do a two minute exegesis on the the like notion of reality. So he I'm not I'm not kidding. It's amazing. Uh, so Big Bird doesn't believe that Mr. Rogers exists. He thinks he's a figment of his imagination. <laughs> well, and then they're able to talk it out. Big Bird closes his eyes. He opens his eyes. You know, Fred Rogers is still there. So. This is like a real ideological battle for like children's, like basically for like what our relationship to reality, right? Like a lot of us were raised on this. So there are some real ideological battles going on that shaped how we relate to the world. Um, so I don't know if you're a Sesame Street kid or a Mr. Rogers kid, but go home and think about that tonight. Uh, and so uh, that, oops. Um, keeping it in Sesame Street. Uh, so I think like that, that whole parable about Mr. Rogers and, and Sesame Street is that is for me, the, the discipline is kind of like the Mr. Rogers show, right? This idea that architecture is sequestered in this kind of fantasy realm where everything is like clearly fantasy and not allowed to interact with the world is kind of one mode that I, I just am exhausted by. Um, it's fine, people do it and it's great. For me, I'm more of a Sesame Street guy. Um, I want things to move out into the world and interact and uh, be able to mess up that clear relationship between fantasy and reality. I think that's what I do in my practice and if I'm gonna advocate for anything, it's that things go out in the world and things have effects in the world. And so I'm, I'm interested in those funny things um, and what kind of work they can do in the world. So uh, the reason I showed this little guy, I don't know, again, if you guys were um, Sesame Street people, you will know that this is one of these things that are not like the other. Um, and the, yeah, the, the blue balloon, of course, is not like the others. But I think the reason I, I show this is because in, in terms of thinking about humor in the physical world, this is kind of step one for most theorists of humor, which is incongruity. So what usually produces humor for us is some off relationship between things um, that allows the, us to sort of uh, resolve that incongruity in our mind um, and, and uh, get some pleasure from it. So, um, like this, for example. Uh, I'm, if anybody needs any more evidence for that theory, um, I don't think you do. So that, that theory has been around for centuries, um, but I think the, the more specific applications of it, um, and, and honestly the way that most people think about humor has been more or less the same since the early 20th century. So of course, here we have uh, Charlie Chaplin's um, Modern Times, and he's getting mixed up in the gears of the factory, right? And that's what's producing humor. And this aligns really well with Henri Bergson's theory of humor. You guys might be uh, familiar with Henri Bergson, but he was a sort of early 20th century process philosopher, um, influenced everyone you know, down the line to Deleuze. But his idea about the way society worked and even the way that experience worked is, is that it had to be continuous and fluid and that one had to be constantly present in the ever-changing reality um, that is human experience. And if one is not, um, then society breaks down. So for him, uh, humor was actually a corrective to, to keep everybody present uh, in the moment um, so that everyone could adapt to the way that the world was changing around them at all times. So if anybody became sort of rigid or repetitive in their behaviors, um, humor for him was a way to root that out. So we would laugh at people um, 
who fall down because they're bad. They're bad at being people, right? Like that is really where Bergson's coming from. But I think there's there's some more interesting things that play out from that. Um, and just that the the root for all humor for Bergson then is that there's some relationship between the mechanical and the human that specifically that he calls it that, that there's something mechanical encrusted on the human. Um, and so there's no shortage of examples of the relationship between the human body and something that's inhuman or mechanical um, that will produce uh, <laughs> humorous reaction. This is Azimo, this is Azimo, Honda's um, like uh, humanoid robot. Uh, hold on, this is the best part. Um, so, uh, Modern Times is uh, <laughs> Modern Times is one example of that, right? But it's a dated example, so it has a kind of dated uh, idea of what it means to be human and what it and what the physical and what it means to be mechanical. Um, and so, for me, a lot of the work is trying to like figure out what contemporary analogs are to the Bergson idea of the relationship between the human and the mechanical. So we have like robots on the one hand, uh, but we also have video games where, you know, this is a kid that just collects glitches in video games. This is Skate, <laughs> this is Skate 3. So now we don't have like a humanoid robot making mistakes, but this is, um, you know, a, a virtual representation of the human body that's interacting in the physical, with the, with the virtual physical world. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but he, he sort of maniacally finds all of these glitches in these, um, in these video games, but there he goes. Hold on, it gets better. <laughs> all right. Um, so I think those are two, you know, two ways that the, this kind of like Bergson, Bergson's theory of humor being is being extended into more contemporary relationships between the body and technology. Um, but I think uh, I'm really interested in designers that are sort of complicating that relationship, like Martin Boss, uh, who's an industrial designer who made these series of clocks where he puts himself inside room-sized um, objects uh, you know, that have the sort of uh, profiles of a digital clock uh, inscribed on it, and then he slowly like paints over and erases uh, the, the different little um, numerals to, to create a clock. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm gonna take a step back uh, and explain what's in the gallery right now. Humor will come back into it um, in a second. But just think about, just remember the kind of relationship between the body and the mechanical in terms of humor. So uh, some of us is in the gallery um, and it started as an entry to the league zone poly competition which we did not win, um, and I'm burned about that. But we <laughs> snuck a part of it into the league, um, and, and so I, I feel pretty proud about that. Um, so the, the Some of Us project started with a kind of um, interest in, in what might be the contemporary carry at it. So if we're looking at these relationships between the physical, um, you know, the sort of bot, the human body and some kind of physical uh, representation of it. Well, the carry added seems like a great uh, candidate for exploration. So the thing about carry added is that there's not a lot of scholarship on them. And like the one thing that uh, has ever been written uh, that people cite is the Vitruvius' account um, that the caryatids are not actually sort of a celebration of, of the human form or feminine beauty, but they're the enslavement of the women of, of a culture that rose up against the, the Athenians. Um, and most people believe that to be apocryphal, but actually recent scholarship has revealed that it's probably true because in that part of the world at that time, the way that uh, one, like the way that one uh, continued to remind one's enemies that uh, they better watch out is to inscribe the symbol of one's enemy into money, into buildings. So uh, if you had conquered another culture, you wouldn't put your own symbol on there. You would put the symbol of your conquered culture on your money. So it's like if you're the lion people, you put the bull getting eaten or you just put the bull on there. Um, and this sort of evolved through the years to, to, become, to become included in 
architecture where you st start to see the symbols of the of the sort of per the different Persian and Greek cultures that are conquering each other um, incorporated into the architecture. So this brings us back to humor. Um, so that that relationship between matter and humanness uh, and the sort of enslavement of uh, of a human being into something like stone is something that we just wanted to consider in the contemporary mode. So here is uh, an animation of a 3D scan of me. <laughs> so that's me, and that's a cabbage. Um, and so I want to bring this back to theory for a second, or to humor theory for a second. So uh, a contemporary of Bergson's was this guy called Lyndon Lewis, who was a humorist, uh, and you know he was a writer. But for him, he kind of had the opposite notion of humor from Bergson, which is that uh, for Bergson, if the the animate is or the the animate behaving mechanically was what produced humor for uh, Wyndham Lewis, it was um, the inanimate behaving human, and so he has this great uh, image of coming upon a cabbage reading the paper, <coughs> right, and that we would find that to be absurd because a cabbage is reading a paper, but. Um, for him, what's actually absurd is that, that we would read a paper and not understand that we are no different than a cabbage. So the idea that like a human being is nothing more than matter and space and time, um, like that, he, that realization, that knowledge is like almost impossible to hold in your mind, right? It's terrifying. And he calls that um, you know, the thunderbolt uh, of reality that nobody can really deal with. And so laughter for him, he calls it summer lightning, which is that which kind of papers over the like horrifying reality that we're all just stuff in space and that we're gonna die someday and that it's all completely temporary. Um, and so that's a really potentially like bleak view of what humor is and what life is. But for me, it, it is like, it's a source of humor, right? Like we all do nervously laugh about things like that. Um, and so what was really interesting to me is the relationship between um, that notion of humor and, and philosophy and 3D scanning, right? So 3D scanning doesn't care whether we're a cabbage or a person. It does the same thing that Wyndham Lewis is asking us to do. Um, it just reduces it all to surfaces. It reduces um, objects um, to virtual representations. Um, that are all, uh, they're all just numeric. It's all the same to a computer. So with that in mind, we started with that kind of base material of 3D scans of ourselves, and we tried to find the most kind of horrifying combinations of columns and people. So instead of, uh, instead of just columns that are based on the proportions of human beings or reproducing ourselves as, uh, you know, as, as full-on human columns like caryatids, these <coughs> terms that combine um, human figures uh, with columns were particularly terrifying uh, because they, they do give you this sense of being trapped in some inanimate material, which again, if we trust Wyndham Lewis is, is what we're all doing, is what we all are right now. So we wanted to kind of make that legible as a way to reframe your relationship to your body, to reality, um, and sort of like make our own version of these people things, of these people objects, um, as an entry to the folly. So that's one part of it, is that we just wanted to deal with the column, or the column person, or the caryatid. And the other idea was that um, in asking for a folly, they were interested in the relationship between sculpture and architecture. And for us, really simply, uh, architecture is just sculpture pushed sufficiently close together. Uh, so. If, we just said if you just took a bunch of objects, pushed them close enough together, you would get a building. Um, and so uh, <laughs> these are the like low, low poly models for uh, modesty. Um, but these are all the sort of uh, the 3D scans of ourselves. And the way we started to try to conflate them or you know, like make them have weird relationships to more column-like objects. And the final project, uh, the final resolution of the project was this um, grouping of columns that you would see on the horizon. And it's actually like rotated at the same angle as the uh, 
Parthenon, um, another little joke. Um, and as you approach it, you would see that this, like, what appears to be a kind of mass begins to break down and allow you to interact with it um, and move between it. The, the name of the project is Between You and Me. Uh -huh. um, and then when you got close enough to it, you would actually begin to like notice that there are like vestigial arms um, and legs here um, and that you could interact with these things that were both things that we know to be kind of architectural elements but also have these like qualities of people. Um, so you can see the plan here, the section here. Um, so you can see the spaces it creates between. Um, and the way we made them uh, was out of aluminum foil. Uh, I mean, CNC cut aluminum foil, but we were really interested in uh, like just how do you make these things? I mean, there's a kind of narrative of fabrication these days. It's just a fidelity to the model, right? The sort of digital being effortlessly fabricated into the, the material. And we just wanted to really play with that. So, uh, and it's just impossible. Like, how would you make metal columns um, with the fidelity of the 3D scans that we got? Um, so we reduced the polygon you know, mesh that was like really simple to unfold. And then we actually just crinkled it back up to make it look like it was higher res. So. <laughs> The crinkling of the aluminum is the image of high resolution uh, form. Uh, so you can see we made a full scale prototype um, to prove to the league that we could do it, but they didn't believe us. Um, and you can, so you can see the way that we introduced like the, the crinkle back in kind of like doesn't allow you to read um, the, you know, what's really pretty wonky geometry. It makes it seem like it's a really super high res precise model. So uh, I'm going to hurry up and, and finish here. You know, we all just want to get to the gallery. But uh, so we try to reimagine this project for, uh, for the exhibition here um, in the gallery. And we took, uh, we started looking at some of the forms we had, and we wanted to put them to work. So if they had no work to do in the folly, because it's just a folly, um, we wanted to use them to show some of our recent projects. So um, here, here we have uh, what we call Sunny, um, holding up a model of our entry to the Chicago uh, Lakefront Kiosk competition. Here's Bendy holding a, a rendering, a banner, of our entry to the Storefront Street Architecture competition. And then here's Hippie, who's holding a chunk of post rock, which I mentioned earlier in the lecture. Um, and all of these people are in the <coughs> audience, actually. Um, so these are like arms based on the 3D models that we got from the scans of ourselves. Um, so here they are, um, fully fabricated <laughs> in an arm. Um, so uh, I was the, I was the, um, Example where I was the prototype that we used for the uh, entry to the competition, so I didn't get to be in this one. Um, so that's me. Like I got to include myself somehow. Um, so this is this is uh, me getting to interact with my friends um, as a column. But of course, the point here is to show again the kind of absurdity. Um, the relationship like between uh, the inanimate object and the human body. I'm dancing the big pimpin' in my head. This will finish on in a second. But so I think that uh, <laughs> 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 all 
right, here I come. So uh, I think this project for me has been a really great way to explore that relationship between like horror and, and humor and the way that humor is often a way to, to respond to these uh, problems that we have with existence. So uh, Simon Critchley, who's a British philosopher, uh, has theorized that uh, it's basically like humor um, is a way to uh, resolve that incredibly hard uh, divide to, to bridge, which is the relation between the physical and the metaphysical. Um, so he quotes Descartes as saying that if we're lucky, like we can do a, a few hours of metaphysics in a lifetime. Um, and for him, the fact that like we're always trying to resolve the relationship between the fact that we are thinking conscious beings and just inanimate stuff in the world all the time, um, you know, according to Bergson, and Lewis and others, the fact that we're always trying to resolve that um, allows us to do metaphysics like maybe a few hours a day. So just by like tripping and falling and, um, you know, taking delight in the physical comedy that is, um, is the world, um, he thinks it's a way to actually begin to interrogate bigger <laughs> issues about life and existence. So I'm going to get to my few requests at the end. Um, one is a uh, PS1 nomination, if anyone out there can make that happen in the next year. Two would be some kind of major commission. I think that would be great. Um, and if anyone uh, wants to, everything's for sale, um, especially if you're a major museum or collector, um, I can give you my email afterwards. Uh, a few more serious requests. Uh, are about like the relationship between humor and space and architecture and not just things. So I think there's some real power in humor. Um, and I think that it's important for us to laugh and for all the reasons that I talked about. But I think that my relation, my like interest in things was kind of waning, not because I don't think there's a lot to learn from things and the way that humor and things relate, but because ultimately I'm an architect and I'm interested in space and I'm interested um, in the way that like human bodies and, and space and things and the sort of broader um, spatial relationships that play out every day. So th this is a Japanese game show that's really amazing. Um, and so I want to end with this, uh, this joke that Andy Kaufman played on the world um, through his television show that they only aired one episode of because it was like so offended the uh, so, so offended the network. Um, so one is just the space of the show. Um, so this is Andy Kaufman, the host. He has a puppet of himself right there. Um, his guests sit eight feet below him. <laughs> the, uh, the audience is pointed out into space. Um, so they have to crane their necks <laughs> up and to the right uh, to see Andy Kaufman. So this is one way, I think, actually, that like, um, slapstick can be built into the environment. And here it's actually playing out in real space and time. <coughs> but I think that as architects, like we're not always there to see it and we can't always be there to, um, you know, it's, it's not always a kind of like motion, motion, or people in motion in space uh, discipline, I guess. So the other joke he played was that in um, the broadcast, he put in fake static and like fake uh, like misregistration. I don't even know what they call that, but on an old television, you know how the picture was sort of like scroll. He built that into the broadcast so that all across America, this was before uh, remote control, people would have to get up off their couches and walk across the room and fiddle with their rabbit ears and not know at all that it wasn't actually the reception, it was a joke on them. Um, and so like only Andy Kaufman and the production team knew about that. Um, and even the people who that joke was being played on didn't know about that. But we can all think about that right now, right? That's a slapsticky joke. Like that takes space and time and nobody knew it happened at the time. But we can all enjoy it right now. And so I think that that's a mode of doing slapstick as an architect is that we have to be ready to do like cognitive slapstick. Like we have to be ready to build stuff into the physical environment that like 
can delight us and can allow us to imagine the possibility for slot clicks happening without actually having to like be there to do it or make the things that do it. Or, um, and so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, artist Bastian Otter, but he um, he really you know he did all these projects where he sort of found these kind of latent potentials in the physical world to do slapstick. And so I guess what I would ask is that everyone sort of begin to animate that part of your imagination, look around the world um, for those moments where the world can be funny um, without, without the, the sort of funniness actually having to happen. And so for me, I think, I don't know if you guys have watched Broad City, um, but I think Broad City is a really uh, amazing show because it's two young women doing, uh, doing sort of slapstick comedy um, finding these kind of latent potentials in the physical world for um, space and the human body to be funny. And I think there's similar issues in the comedy world that there are in architecture right now, where it's like, uh, these are two young women, um, and they are not women that like sexualize themselves, and they're not women that like <coughs> make fun of their bodies. They're just women who are women, like, who move around in space and it's funny. And that's really radical. It's a kind of like meta critique of the comedy world right now where like women are still marginalized. And so I think like women doing slapstick is a really important thing that's happening in the world right now. And I think that there are practices like this, um, like Muff, for example, um, in London, where they're doing things like this in cities as architects. Again, I think they're doing cognitive slapstick by doing things like putting a tree in the road so that like, or benches in the road so we have to like drive around it or move around it or run into it. And again, like we don't see this happen, but we can imagine it happening. And so I think this is the kind of architecture that asks us to imagine um, the funny things that can happen in space that I'm really excited about. Thanks, guys.